when we started buying land, we really realized quickly that you can't buy it all. It's not big enough, it's too expensive. When you own land, land comes with a lot of stewardship and management responsibilities. And there's no, there's no entity on the planet that could buy all the land that needs to be protected. So from there, we kind of evolved into conservation easements. And conservation easements are left onto themselves, but it's a voluntary agreement that private landowners enter with a land trust or government agency that says this piece of land forever will not be developed. And that becomes part of the deed. It's a very legal transaction. Um, but that expands the realm of land you can protect. It's not to buy it you can hold a conservation easement on it. And now the conservation easement as a legal tool is not that old, 50 or so years. Um, and as the, as the Nature Conservancy developed conservation easements, it's also developed a whole land trust um, industry that's, that's developed in the country, which is a wonderful thing. There are hundreds and hundreds of local and large scale, um, small scale, statewide, local, um, regional, land trusts around the country. We have many right here in Missoula. Five Valley Land Trust, Rocky Mountain Mill Foundation. There's a number in Montana. Montana's very good at conservation easements. So as the Nature Conservancy kind of spread this conservation easement tool out there, said, so, okay, well that's great. Now there's all these land trusts to do it. What are we gonna do next? And so that's what we, we're, um, the next real stage in our development was realizing that to get lasting, tangible conservation on the ground, you have to work with communities. And this is a, a, a concept that's developed over the last however many decades, where it came out of Africa with community-based conservation. If you don't involve the people who live in the land that you're trying to protect in that conservation, it's not going to last. And if you do, it's going to last and it's going to blossom and it's going to be incredibly effective. So we became very community-based. We call these community-based programs. What I do is a community-based program for the Nature Conservancy. I work in this community with the people who live on and manage this land to, um, to develop strategies to help the <coughs> And now what the Nature Conservancy is looking at now is like we're we're a very small planet with great needs to protect large places. And so we've got to go big. And so what I'm going to talk to you today is one of the, one of the biggest projects the Conservancy's ever done. But that's just in a nutshell who the Nature Conservancy is. In Montana, it, part of the Nature Conservancy's approach is to be very strategic about where we work. Work in the places that will make the most difference, that have the best opportunity, that you can actually protect those targets, those conservation targets that you're trying to protect. Ah, um, these are the areas in Montana that we work. The Great Plains and the grasslands, um, southwest Colorado and the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, and the county. One thing I want to point out about these lines, although they look like really thick lines on the map, really they should be perforated. Because in all these places, we're not talking about creating islands. We know better than to create an island of protection. What we need to be talking about is all the leaks from these areas into these the lake reservoirs that pull out here. It's not just these round places, but these are the areas that we focus on. Yeah, question. I'm sorry to interrupt. Could you kill the lights in the front? Oh, sure. It's kind of hard to see. Yeah, so you can see. <laughs> Nice. Thank you. Yeah, that's a little dim, isn't it? Is that better? <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, so the crown. This is where I work. Here's Missoula. And what I want to point out here is the core of wilderness, the Bob Marshall, the glacier, and the water. And that really is the core of the crown. Those protected lands that are wilderness create the core of this amazing place. But there's an awful lot of land outside that core. And what's unique about the crown of the continent? And I, I got to take some credit to this concept because I was having a, a beer with Sanjan. You know Sanjan? He's a, I think he's an adjunct professor here. He's one of our chief scientists. And he was visiting in this really was about to move to Montana. And I was having a beer in the kettle house for them. And it was, you know, I was saying how special Montana is and how unique the Crown of the Continent was. And he said, oh yeah, you know, I hear that from everybody. I hear that from project managers in Iowa, I hear it from Florida, I hear it all over the world. What's so special about the Crown? I said, it's intact. We haven't lost any of our species. We have all the species that work here on the Missouri Park came through. 
But he was like, huh, really? Well, I'm going to check that out because I think you're wrong. And so he did, and he found out, he came out with this paper, which shows that we're intact. So we are one of the very few intact ecosystems in North America. In fact, the only intact ecosystem in the lower 48 states. And what that does mean is that we still do have our species, our pseudo-species, our ecological processes that function in this area of the ground in the Great Yellowstone ecosystem. But what's interesting is, you know, so that's interesting because you're like, okay, that's a nice kind of fun fact to really tell, but what about it? Well, there aren't that many places on the planet that still have all their species. When you look at it worldwide, it's pretty chilly, um, and clearly most of them are up north. But there's some other things to look at with this. These are these intact areas, I don't know if you can see that, the green outlines, and looking at protected areas, like wilderness. And you'll see that a lot of them have a lot of protected areas. We certainly do. But a lot of them don't. A lot, a lot of these intact places aren't necessarily protected like wilderness. And what that also shows is this is the human footprint, and these are the intact areas. And look at the footprint on the planet. Now we've got to be looking, we've got to be talking about integrating people with conservation, people with ecosystem protection, people and their livelihoods with protecting these special places in the world. And I'm not just saying intact places are the only places that are special. We know that there are all kinds of places on, on the planet that have incredibly high biodiversity that are wholly worthy of protection. And intactness is just one of those criteria. It's interesting. One of the things that makes the area we live in so unique are this distribution of carnivores and predators. And we look at the historic map of the United States, and you look at it now, up here with the only dark color, but what strikes me are these big blank spots on the map where the carnivores are gone. And we all know that carnivores are incredible in that they're incredibly important in that whole pyramid of every species that comes below it, and it's really an ecological process. In that is an important part of the component, you know, to have an intact and thriving ecosystem, you've got to have predators. That's what we're learning about wolves, sharks, everything. We know that the predators play such an important role in keeping things in balance and keeping things back down in the environment. It's just another example of what, where grizzly bears used to be and where they're from today. So, yeah, predators. Um, we've, got, we've got them all which is pretty, like I say, unique. We've got wolves, we've got wolverines, we've got lynx. We've got grizzly bears, we've got, we've got all the mustelids, we've got fishers still, we've got martins. Um, we, this is in there, for the most part, you know, we've got lots of them, or relatively lots of them. So this goes back again to this idea that here the dark green areas on the map is the wilderness areas, the really protected areas, and what we got to do, just protecting the crown or the salmon cell in this gigantic roadless and protected area here in the Greater Yellowstone, to keep all these animals thriving and persisting on into the future, we've got to connect it all. We've got to be thinking at that scale. And on up into Canada. You know, the mind doesn't end just there. You know, things move up north as well. The other important thing about the crown is the steep running here on campus. Um, when you're facing climate change, areas that are this big and this intact and this protected have, are going to be fascinating to watch as climate change proceeds, and especially watching the adaptation and the resiliency of these systems. Why is the crown and this part of the world so important? Because we've got mountains. And mountains provide so many different kinds of weather and temperatures and um, different systems through a, a elevation gradient. We have a wide variety of precipitation from west to east and um, up and down. And we got animals can move among this big place. The bears on the Rocky Mountain front come over the Blackfoot, go up to the Swan, and then up to Glacier. They can do that. There's enough room for them to connect. And it's northerly. Um, and then they've got a lot of different aspects and slopes as well. So you know, hopefully this little guy in the pipe will still have enough room to be able to persist. The core wilderness areas, <coughs> the, the parks, 
But then again, here are all the areas around it. 20% of the crowded continent, crowded continent is around 10 to 12 million acres. 20% of that's private. Um, and a big chunk of it is also its forest service or other public land management agencies that's not willing to You've got the Blackfeet Reservation up here as well. And what, what this map is showing is conserved lands, lands that are protected, those private lands that are protected are in the red, which is pretty impressive. Um, that, and I'll talk about it. We've got better maps of what the MLP looks like. But in, when you look at the crown, and you look at the amount of protected land that circles these wilderness areas, it's a pretty much a key to why we still have what we have. And there's a lot of work left to be done, but it's pretty impressive. So what are the threats to what we care about in the crown of home, to the ecological processes, to the wildlife species in the, um, the communities that are here? Number one, dispersed residential development. Um, having houses spread out into the forest in far-reaching places. Why? Why is that a big deal? Well, Chris Green tells us, and all the visitor biologists tell us, that we want grizzly bears to survive. We need to keep rural home density down. And that rural home density is what um, it's going to make the difference between the kind of as a mess or not or not. Fire suppression. We clear this is a fire adapted system. This place needs fire. It has to have fire. And the more houses you have out in the woods, the less fire you can have. The higher your cost of suppression, but most importantly, your tolerance <coughs> for fire is going to go down. If there are fewer houses, you can let more fires burn. The reason why Forest Service and DNRC needs to put out fires <coughs> The primary reason is to protect buildings, to protect infrastructure, to protect homes. Invasive species coming along with people are all these different species that we bring with us or come along with us or we put in the water. And those are a huge threat to the native systems. <coughs> and then a bunch of other threats. We're seeing oil and gas. These are seismic trucks on the Rocky Mountain front and an oil well going in on the Rocky Mountain front, or gas oil, excuse me. Um, and who knows what that boom is going to do over on the front, um, whether it's going to really boom or whether it's going to slowly peter away. We're not sure, but we've got to be ready for whatever it comes. The poor grazing practices, um, the mines up in the upper, the, this is the old Mike Horse mine up in the upper, um, at upper waters of the Blackfoot, um, a lot of recreational use. This is the um, mountaintop removal coal mine up in the Elk River up in Canada. They were, they were slated to do another mine just like this in the North Fork of the Flathead in, um, up in British Columbia. Thankfully that's been stopped, but it's certainly a threat. This picture, I think it's fascinating. You know, this is, I don't know how long ago this is, but clearly this rancher shot these two grizzly bears to protect his sheep. Now, because of the work we've done in the communities in the Blackfoot and the Rock Mountain Front and the Swan, you, rare, you certainly wouldn't see this now. Um, but what we've done is we have worked with um, the Blackfoot Challenge, the Rock Mountain Front Advisory Council, and ranchers to put electric fence, high voltage, high tensile electric fence around the cabin yard, around the sheep, and around um, beehives. There are a lot of other systems in place to protect grizzly bears or to protect ranchers from grizzly bears and vice versa. We have this great system in the Blackfoot of carcass pickup, and it's moved over to the front in some other places as well. When the rancher has a dead livestock, what they used to do is just throw it in the bone yard, um, and that's just, you know, where the bear smells that, and it comes in from miles away. What we do now is there's a truck that comes and picks up all the carcasses and takes them to a facility. You know where the where Stoney's is, the Clearwater Junction, where the giant steer is? Well, just before you get there, there's a giant composting facility that's full of dead livestock. And then they take the compost that's generated that and they spread it on the highways, and it's great fertilizer. But what it really does is it reduces that grizzly bear attractant. So by reducing the grizzly, the attractants grizzly bears have to get them in trouble, the, the problems, the conflicts with grizzly bears, both in the Blackfoot and the Rocky Mountain Front, have decreased dramatically, 100 fold. Um, so you don't see this so much anymore, you don't, but what you do see is this. This is the grizzly bear fair that was pulled up by Lincoln a few years ago. It was hit by a pickup truck in the wee mornings of the evening. 
from wee hours of the morning. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a really dark grizzly bear, but the grizzly bear was down um, getting to garbage. And so it was down by the, by the road, and it got hit by the truck, and I just happened to be in Orlando when Jamie jumped on the bear while and just brought this by. It was an incredibly beautiful bear, um, but basically built um, because of garbage. And this, I'll talk quite a bit about you know, all the road system from all the old timbering practices that add sediment to the streams and overfishing. So what do you do about all those threats? When you've done all those threats, what's going to be your strategic approach to protecting this place? Well, then it's going to be a mix. What we do is a mix of land protection. We work heavily with partnerships and we do a lot of stewardship or working with people on their stewardship practices. But let me talk about, just to back up about land protection. And this is really setting the stage for the National Legacy Project, for the Black Community Project. And it's a little um, history lesson and a, and a lesson in property law. And really the way our, our property looks, the way our land is divided up in townships, ranges, and sections, all has to do, well, it goes back to the days when um, John Wesley Powell, you know, floated down the Colorado River. He was a Civil War veteran, and when he was, and he lost his arm in the Battle of Shiloh, and he came out west and he floated the Colorado River twice. And when he came out here as part of the USGS, and when he had done this, when he spent time in the West, he went back to Congress and he said, we should not cut up the West on this township and range system. All the land should be divided by watershed, because if you don't have water in the West, your land's not be good. You've got to have access to water. And if you have a section one, if the streams over here are 915 and 28, section one's worthless. Don't do it this way. Well, clearly, Powell lost. And we now have this system of um, townships and ranges throughout the western United States. What we have in the east is meets and bounds. You kind of, we describe your land by, from that camera, 20 feet to the west to that clock, and then over here. I mean, it's a completely different system. So this is a lot easier to do, but what it does is it places this grid on the landscape. Um, how you put that grid on the landscape, President Lincoln, I gotta stop using the, the laser, I get carried away and I wish I had a C stick. <laughs> <laughs> President Lincoln <laughs> um, passed the railroad tax. And what he basically did, and this is back in the 1860s, you know, here we've got this whole western part of the United States and nobody's in it. And how do you protect it if you can't get there when you build railroads? How do you build railroads across this vast wilderness? You got to give the railroad companies huge incentives, and so that's what he did. He gave them, gave the railroad companies every other square mile along these railroad. These are the, the transcontinental railroad paths, and the railroad companies that were building them got land as part of their incentive to build the railroad. It started out just a mile on either side of the tracks. And then it ended up at six miles on either side of the tracks. So the railroad companies are pretty cool mechanism. The railroad companies are smart. You know, they don't just take, okay, we'll just take that whole swath there. They take a checkerboard. They take every other square. So if you own the red squares on the checkerboard, the person who owns the black squares can't do that much. You really control, it's a very difficult way to manage land, but it's a great way to control what happens on the surrounding lands. So we ended up with this legacy of checkerboard land ownership throughout the West that was owned by the railroad companies. It was land that went out of the federal estate into the private estate. So what does that mean? It means you have a land ownership pattern that's long. These, this is, you know, land. We know the land ownership boundaries are very clear. Either from the air or when you're walking along, you're like, oh, I hit the boundary because they are literally this sharp on the landscape because these are heavily managed and these are forest service lands. This was managed for timber and this is forest service land adjacent to it. So that's what it ends up looking like on the ground. As a manager, it's very difficult to do it, to, to go from corner to corner or corner to corner and have different, this, this drastically different kind of land management. So now I'm going to tell the story of the Legacy Project, but it starts in the Blackfoot. 
And here, here again is just a great example of that, of this Western land ownership pattern. The pink and the salmon were plum creek. Obviously the green is forest service, this is wilderness. The yellow is BLM. This gray is Lubrecht, owned by the university. The blue is state land. State land is also checkerboard. When Montana and the Western states became a state, they bought two um, sections per township, 16 and 36. And, and as, again, that kind of land trades happen, you end up with more consolidated blocks in some townships that have no more state land. But it was part of the deal, it was the equal footing doctrine of the Western states becoming part of the United States. The states got this land to support universities like this and to support schools. And so that state land, they cut timber, they graze cattle, they lease for oil and gas because the revenue pays for um, schools, for education, for universities. So that's what that blue land is. Um, there's some um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service refuge land, and there's some fish and wildlife, fish, wildlife and parks, wildlife management areas in the light blue. I think that guy's <coughs> And then there's all this white. The white is the private that's not the form of the On this map, I don't know if you can see it, but there's there's cross hatches on these lands, and here those all have conservation easements on them, which is really impressive. So the Blackfoot's got this checkerboard land ownership. And it's got these communities in it. It's got communities of ranchers and loggers and fly fishermen and you name it, and wealthy people who move there because it's gorgeous. And these communities care deeply, these people in these communities care deeply about their landscape and their livelihoods. And everything happens at Trixie's. This is where more <laughs> conservation has happened than anywhere else on the planet, is in Trixie's. They've never been there. Um, and what happened in the Blackfoot is actually quite unique. It came out of some local landowners who were just great local leaders. And they decided what we need to do is we need to start sitting down at the table and talking to each other. And we need to talk to the agencies of BLM, we need to talk to the Forest Service, Fish and Wildlife and Parks, we need to talk to the Fish and Wildlife Service. We, um, Plumpy needs to be there, the ranchers need to be there. We all need to sit down and just start talking. And then we need to start actually getting stuff done on the ground. And it's remarkable what's come out of the black, but even before it was um, organized as a challenge, the reason why we have block management where you get to hunt on private land, or the, the river access on the black, but where we get to float and have access to the river and get out on the, on the banks, that was all came out of these landowners the conservationism and legislation in Montana came from landowners, you know, getting excited with this shape of it. Came out of landowners in the Blackfoot sitting together and saying, there's this tool out there we wanted in Montana. They brought it to Montana, um, actually through the Nature Conservancy. But so what happened through this, pulling people together, talking, building trust, and say it's not just about the natural resources, it's very much about the natural resources, but it's also about us who <coughs> live here and want to continue to live here. The great things can happen. Um, and sitting at that table at the Blackfoot Challenge is where we came up with the concept of the Blackfoot Community Project. And what the community project was is in Plum Creek in the 90s, they, they bought um, Champion Lands in 92, 93 somewhere around there, in the early 90s, Plum Creek bought all of, pretty much all of Tim and they ran it as a timber company. And Tim um, was a very viable um, economic model and was very successful. But in the 90s, in the late 90s, they, they reorganized as a real estate investment trust. And what that meant was they, they realized that all this land they owned had as much or more value than the timber that grew on it. And so they started to get much more into the land, um, real estate, and uh, uh, the business, um, which makes perfect sense. And they got lots of great land. But they came, they were part of the Blackfoot Challenge, and they said the Blackfoot Challenge meeting, hey, you know, all this land in the Blackfoot from Rogers Pass, at least down to Clearwater Junction, we don't want it anymore. Because it's not that productive, and it's pretty far away from our mills. You know, this is drier country than a lot of the other country we own, so it's, you know, we're going to sell it. And meanwhile, they'd already been selling off some key pieces along the river and some really beautiful chunks, and everybody was like, oh my gosh, you know, all this work we've done for all this time to protect our valley is completely at risk.
us to being unraveled by moving all this land and the land, Pine Creek lands this land. You know, it's the land, here's the national forest, here are the ranches in the bottom, Plum Creek's all this land in between. It's really kind of the back covering of the valley. So what we decided we would do is we decided we'll buy it. There's kind of that old TNC model, like, hey, there's some land that needs protection, we'll just buy it. Well, 89,000 acres is a lot of land. So it was a huge step for the Nature Conservancy to step out and spend tens of millions of dollars to buy this land from Plum Creek. But we did it because we knew it was the right thing to do from a conservation perspective and because the communities led the way and asked us to. Had we come in with our suits and ties from Washington, D.C. and said, we're the Nature Conservancy, we're here to help, we're going to buy all this land, it would not have worked. But because we've been sitting at that table for a long time and the community said, hey, Nature Conservancy, help us out here, can you buy this land? And then we looked hand in glove with the Black Foot Challenge to get this project done. We had so many community meetings and we asked everybody in Lincoln, Greenville, <coughs> Vandal, Helmville, Sealy, what do you want us to do? What do you want, where do you want this land to go? What's your vision of what, what's important to you that, about um, what the future trajectories of, of this land? And what we heard in a survey <laughs> that here at the University of Montana with um, well, Joe was, they went out, not Jim. What we heard in that survey, now I'm, really, now I'm getting nervous because I, I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure natural resources were really important. Came out on top. These are ranchers and loggers, and natural resources was the thing that was most important. But also, they wanted to continue to be a working landscape, have economic stability, and public access. And public access comes up again and again and again. In Montana, we love our public access. It's just, it's part of who we are, and we don't like it when it gets taken away. Um, so that's what we heard, and those were the main goals of the project. And so what we did, and I'll, I'll skip kind of through this. This is, this is the land we bought first. This is the 89,000 acres of concrete land um, that we purchased as part of the Legacy and the Community Project. And then we worked through to then sell that to different land management agencies. And I like this map because it shows this is just 1996, not that long ago. The pink land is the Plum Creek, and the tan land is the private um, unprotected. And this is what it looks like now. The pink land is much smaller, and all of this land, including this um, cross section, is protected in the Black Bear River Valley. Um, but we were, we, you know, it was successful. And people were like, oh, this is great. I can't believe what you guys did in the black, but we want to do it too. And the folks in the Swan River Valley, especially Melanie Parker, and the folks in the Potomac, especially Danny Iris and the rancher there, said, you cannot, you the Nature Conservancy, have got to help us out. You can't stop with the black, but we're just as much at risk. So this was in the early 2000s. You know, we, we've got a problem here. We've been shipping away in the swan. We've been working with the Trust for Public Land for decades to protect the most important parts of that valley. But it was too little, was it? It was taking too long. It was section by section rather than on a huge scale. And the um, same thing, Plum Creek had told them. And then, you know, good for Plum Creek to be at the table with everybody saying, by the way, this is the future. This is what we're looking at selling. First 10,000 acres in the swan, then 20,000 acres. Then more. <coughs> and the folks in the Swan at the Swan Ecosystem Center were saying, wait, well, we've got to do something. But they'll tell you something land in the Swan River Valley is way more expensive than land in the Black River Valley. Really. And we were already, you know, we kind of choked on um, purchasing the land in the Black But what we got together with TBL, Trust for Public Land, a bunch of funders, and local people, and we all had this meeting at Holland Lake Lodge up in the Swan, and the, the Montana Legacy Project concept was born in them. And what we did, here's the Plum Creek lands in the footprint of the Legacy Project. Before, that's what we bought. We bought 310, give or take, thousand acres of land in Plum Creek. We bought everything in the Swan Valley, and that was our number one priority. The Swan is incredibly productive from a wildlife, wetlands, Everything is important. It's got great streams, it's got great wetlands, it's an important fishery, 
Um, it was on all of our scientific rankings. The swan always popped out as the first. So our first priority was to get everything in the swan, and we did. We, you know, here's the clear water. We would have loved to have gotten more in the clear water, but that was that was all they um, that was all we could buy. This is Fish Creek. This is Lolo Creek, Penny Creek. Um, here's Miller Creek, Schwartz Creek. Um, this is the Clark Fork face when you're driving down the interstate, the um, Missoula Granite County line. Um, and this is the Potomac Valley and the um, Blackfoot. This is Marshall Ski <coughs> area. And, and that's, that's what we bought. Mill Creek on the edge of the reservation, on the, on the Potomac Reservation. But our goals, our goals were here three. First, of course, conservation. Um, this is such an important place for conservation. Conservation was primary. But it was also to remain a working landscape. This is where people live. It's not a wilderness. It's land that's been, been heavily um, roaded and timbered, but it still provides amazing habitat. And uh, the amazing watershed and provides it recreational. But it needed to stay a working landscape. We're not talking about wilderness designation. And the key, the, the one that's most hurtful, public access. And so those were our goals. And this is what um, kind of the attributes of the of the project. Um, a huge amount of streams protected. And I keep going back to kind of the climate change idea too. What are we gonna, what's most at risk, what are one of the things that's most at risk with climate change is water. So if we've got this many miles of stream that we can protect and keep connected and help restore and go and become um, old, clean, connected fisheries, then um, you know, that was a huge uh, plus of this project. I love these um, slides because of what it shows about um, grizzly bears. Here's the Swan Valley. Here are the swans, here are the missions. Now when, before, this is um, Christian being um, radio colored, 10 bears over three years, don't quote me on that, but this is um, a number of different bears activities, and obviously they didn't walk in those straight lines, but it was one point and then how many hours or later another point and another point. So it just really shows where they have been. It's not necessarily the travel corridors. But what we had thought was, you know, it was the bottom was where we needed to protect for the bears. And we needed to get so that they could cross from the swans to the missions to get to these great wilderness areas. Well, this, this data shows us just the opposite. It's the bottom where the grizzly bears are hanging out. It's the bottom along the river and the wetlands that really lush country that's important to the bears. And all of a sudden, it was like, whoa, you know, this idea that we're creating you know, these corridors from wilderness to wilderness was thrown out the window because that's not what the bears need. This is the Blackfoot, and these are bear ranges. Here's the wilderness. Here's where the bears are. <coughs> um, and th this is Melanie Parker. Oh, no, that's Marie. Um, but you know, they, they like roads. <laughs> but this is in this one. And what we did, and now, a lot, most of this land, a big chunk of this land, went to the Forest Service and is continuing to go to the Forest Service because there the Forest Service owns the adjacent the, the squares. And what this has allowed the Forest Service to do was all of a sudden to manage things on a watershed basis instead of every square miles. And what it, when Plum Creek, um, because this is their business, was harvesting so heavily for the Forest Service, that meant they can't harvest. And what's next door to them is basically cut heavily, they can't do that. Their cumulative effects won't let them harvest on their land when this is what's happening next door. But now that they own all the land, they can manage it much more effectively on a larger scale. Um, public access. These are a few of the signs um, of land that Plum Creek had sold that had cut off public access. And you know, the implications for fire management, if you don't have those houses, as like I was saying earlier, it's um, you don't have to protect them or risk your life to save them. Not that of course we're supposed to stop putting fires, but there'll be a lot less motivation to go in places that um, 
couple of different houses that are not there. So here's where we are with the outset. When, when it's all said, no, the Nature Conservancy doesn't want to own an acre of this now. You know, there's 89,000 acres in the Blackfoot and 300 in Canada and the Legacy Project. That's 400,000 acres of land. We don't want to own any of that when it's all said and done. We want to hand it off to its next owner and put it, you know, that's where it's going to stay. But we're, we're not going to keep any of it. So what we sold it to is all this dark green is for our service. And that was in one transaction, we, we got 117,000 acres of land for the Forest Service. And that was with a great help of Senator Bacchus as well. Um, this this uh, dark blue land, this land, this blue land here is the Swan River State Forest. And just in December, we sold all of this land to the state. So this is now not a checkerboard. board. That's all blue. This is all green. This land has a um, conservation easement with fish, wildlife, and parks on it. This is the Marshall Creek Wildlife Management Area that Fish, Wildlife, and Parks now owns. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But this is this is just an incredible area. And this is Fish Creek, which is also a wildlife management area owned by Fish, Wildlife, and Parks. This is now also state land in the Potomac um, State Forest. We've also sold some to adjacent landowners with conservation easements. We sold some to the city of Missoula. But we still own the stuff in red. So we still own a fair chunk of it. Um, ideally, this will all go to the Forest Service. This will all go to the Forest Service. This will go to the Forest Service. This will go to the DLM. And this will go to the Forest Service and hopefully to maybe a community of conservation um, community of forest in this one. But we still own a fair amount of that land. Um, this is Marshall Lake. And we go back to that. When we bought this land, you know, we inked our purchase and sale agreement in 2008, in June of 2008. You know, land prices were high. <laughs> You know, 2008 was a very different time in Canada than it was in 2009 or 2010. And the, what the implications for this piece of ground, because it's that, this beautiful lake and this really nice mountain that you could put um, ski areas on, the folks in Cedar Lake were scared to death that this place was going to become a beautiful resort community with a lake and a ski area. And they didn't have a reason to believe that it would. Um, so now it's protected for. Um, the lakes and the coal trout that are in there. Fish Creek. This is another now wildlife management area. This is the most important coal trout stream in the middle part of the Clark Fork River. And this was the, now that it's all in fish, wildlife, and park streams, it's the least developed valley in Western There are very, very few private animals in that entire valley. And when we, when we owned it, um, when we owned Fish Creek, we started doing some restoration and pulling out some culverts and doing some stream restoration. And we've done this in a number of instances. And what it does, how it helps the agencies is, you know, we, the Nature Conservancy, we can start doing something on our land. It's our private land. So we can start, you know, doing these major reconstructed um, um, restoration projects without any kind of NEPA, National Environmental Policy Act, or NEPA, Montana Environmental Policy Act, we just do it for our land. And they inherit it from us, and there's this really great restoration project that they get along with the land. And so what we're able to do in Fish Creek by us starting this project, and this is, so this is, I don't know, maybe everybody, anybody can up Fish Creek? It, it's really beautiful, and I don't want everybody to think that it all looks like that, but some of it does look like that. You know, it was heavily eroded and harvested and then burned. It burned in the 2003 Fish Creek Fire, and then it was harvested again. So you do have slopes that look like this. And this is a group of volunteers going out to reseed and help put this, put those roads and these um, streams back to bed. I don't know if any of you know Tom Roy. Tom came out to help with that project. He was the head of the United States Department for a long time. And one of the legacies of the legacy project is are these road systems. These are old logging roads, and we have thousands of miles of them. But what we did with Fish Creek before we sold it to Fish, Wildlife, and Parks is we started to store them which means cut off access to them, pull out all the culverts or any other kind of 
interference of the road with any of the streams or waterways so that those streams can run without any kind of uh, uh, constriction or obstruction and, and put those roads to bed. And that's, so that's what we could do. Now, Fish, Wildlife, and Parks is continuing to do that, as well as in the Marshall Law. They've done a remarkable job of, of getting rid of the roads in the Marshall Law. I don't know I the one thing about the Marshall Law, I thought I had a slide on, but which is really remarkable, is this area in the Sealy Swan has the highest density of Canada lakes in the lower 48. Here, not here, here. And it's because of the snowpack and the habitat that there are more lakes now protected in this wildlife management area. It's the stronghold of the lakes. But what we also, as part of all of this, is the stewardship. Um, this is uh, one of our rancher partners in the Blackfoot, David Nance, and you know, working with David on what he's doing, what he's got. This is a Peruvian and Shepherd, and he's got sheep, that's what it's awesome. But what he does is he gets sheep out there to manage the weeds, and they bring sheep to manage weeds, and so they don't have to spray. You have to spray, you can spray for as many years as you want, but it's kind of never ending in for their chemicals and money. And so the Manix brothers are using sheep to help manage their weeds, but they're also in really dense grizzly country. So they, they have shepherds and they have farm dogs, and they were able to work with both the sheep and the grizzly brothers to keep their own. Get weeds down. But we also, you know, this is, you gotta be spray the weeds as well. I mean, these roads, the, the legacy project, the community project, lands have lots of roads, and long roads are weeds. And, you know, and so we've been doing, spending an awful lot of time managing weeds. Um, fire, we would love to put more fire back on the ground, and that's something we're moving towards. We do a lot with fire on our, um, in the Rocky Mountain Fund. In timber, you know, the Nature Conservancy is now a timber operator. With the Legacy Project came a fiber supply agreement. We cut trees and sell them to concrete because they sold us so much land. We've been doing it for five years now. We've employed um, 70 or 80 local contractors and added millions of dollars into the local economy by employing loggers to cut trees. Um, this, is, this is one of our timber sales. <coughs> The other thing, and I, I don't know that I've hit it hard enough, but I'll try and hit it hard now. By working with your local communities and working with your local landowners and your community groups, when you go to talk to Senator Tester or Secretary Salazar or the President, you have a, a rancher from the Rocky Mountain Front go and talk to anybody in D.C., you're going to get a whole lot more room than having a staff person from the nature of the When you have the local communities rallying around, there's Jim Stone from the Blackfoot Challenge, Melanie Parker from the Swan, and Dusty Prairie from the Rocky Mountain Front. And what we did, in, um, this is in the first American Great Outdoors listening session that was held in the Blackfoot June 1st of 2010. We had the governor, we had both our senators, Secretary Salazar of Agriculture, the head of CDQ, the head of Parks. We had these high-level administrative people in the Blackfoot to talk about community-based conservation, to talk about collaboration, to talk about what happens in these landscapes here in Montana that works so well. Um, so the message is being heard as long as you're messing with it on the local people. So just to sum up, you know, when you look at the crown, and you look at these wilderness areas, but then if you don't protect those private and um, the, the private and the forest lands around it, you won't have the integrity um, if you just have the wilderness areas. And then I like this slide too because it also helps kind of point out how those connections between the crown and this giant salmon cellway, we got to protect those as well. We can't do it without partners, and this is just a, a smattering of the folks that we work with. Um, no organization can do this by themselves. And then that's, oh, sorry, well, for the, um, it's from the counties to the agencies to you name it. And really, it's just, it's all about the future. 
So it's, um, it's uh, it, the, what I love about the work that we're all doing is you when know, I look at the black button and the trajectory of people's visions of what needs to be done and what can be done, it's pretty inspiring. Um, and it's because people started working together and uh, working towards that common cause of protecting their place and their communities. That's it. Like, changed it, and so they could allow that, even though originally the original, like, 
contract. You know, states and all the law XYZ can't do that and stuff. Um, so who's kind of, I don't know, is that a piece of work that you work with? I can't remember, honestly. It was this last semester, though, this last August semester. It sounds so. awfully familiar. Um, that, that there, no, that is, there isn't, that hasn't. <laughs> There is an easement on that piece of ground that they're talking about. There's the, the wine, the, the, um, from my course wine, the families from the my course wine. <coughs> that's actually the only piece of land that's not used. It's, it's privately owned, but the, 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 the neighbor has a, I don't, I think he has a neighbor. But so you put your questions in excellent one. Because, you know, easements aren't that old. They started in the 50s or 60s. Um, and what we're seeing as they change ownership, Either through inheritance or selling, they can sell your land if you've got an easement. That um, the second or third generation owner might not be as committed to the provisions of the easement as the original owner. But what we're, you know, percentage wise, um, yes, there are violations. But in that easement, it's a contract. And, and I have a remedy against a landowner who violates the easement. If they put a building where they weren't supposed to put the building, I can come in and first. I have to monitor that easement every year. I have to go out there and I talk to you, and I have to say, and I have to walk around the ground and say, oh yeah, no, you think, okay, this, yeah, you're good. Or I can, I can walk and say, what, well, you're building a foundation, if you can't build that, you have to stop that, and you have to put it back the way it was. So, and land trusts have evolved over, over the last many decades, too, and there's now um, an accreditation process, and there's much more um, oversight of how they manage. Are there problems? You, you bet. I mean, it's a human creation. Um, it's a legal creation, and yes, there will be problems. Have you can condemn an easement? Uh, like a, a federal or state government can come and condemn a piece of property and say, you might have a conservation easement, but never mind our next interstate highway is coming through there, and we can terminate an easement that way. Or you know, a big bomb came down and knocked out get your entire property back to you know, the easement. But really in, um, in the decades that easements have been on the books, the violations are very few and there are there have been almost no it was a county in Wyoming who held an easement and she held an easement and made the same that was awkward and got rid of it. But then you know that's not a thing. So it's a it's a legal entity for human beings. Are there problems? Of course there are, but it's a tool, it's a very good and a very strong tool. Let's make that. Yes. So you're saying that the, the Nature Conservancy has to monitor all these easements or if you sell the easements to the land trust, then they have to monitor these easements. Yes, we don't sell easements. So the, the, easements so the Nature are, Conservancy has kept the easements on no, all these? No, it, that's a really good point. In all of our land in Blackfoot and the Legacy Project, we um, almost all of our easements are held by Five Valleys Land Trust, or Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, and some by U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. We're not holding easements on the land we hold. Okay, so it's the land trust that it's going to be their job to ensure that the rules of the easements are honored in perpetuity? Yes. But easements can still be sold, correct? No. There's no value to an easement. There's nothing to sell. Okay. You, as a landowner, I'm sorry, back up. You own 640 acres. You own one of those sections. And you want to put an easement on it, but you, you want to be, you want to be um, compensated. You, yeah. you can sell your easement. Yes. We can work with Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, a number of different granting programs, and we can come up with the appraised value of that easement, and then we will buy the easement from you. You, the original landowner, yeah. you, the grantor of the easement, can get fair market value or close to it for that easement. And that value is the difference between what your land is worth with development versus what it's worth with no development. Yeah. So that gap is the value of the easement. Yes, we can pay you for that easement. But then, then it, after that, you can't hurt yourself. It's done. So it's not like selling my mineral rights, which you can then convey to someone so else, again, right. or someone rich enough could value. buy back the easement right. and no one buy it. Okay. Can't do it. It's that one-time transaction to pay a landowner for that initial for the easement. But then every other landowner who owns that piece of ground, that value, the value is falling down. 
the development value is now held by the land trust, but there's no real, you know, it's not some, it's not fungible, it's not something I can trade or, or get any money for. Not a marketable it's, security. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. And, and we, the Nation Pacific does hold a lot of these things in you know, all across the country. We, we, I mean, if we have plans to make some parts of their main passes to go out and monitor the easements and talk to one another so that we can. So, you know, that's part of, that's part of the work that we do. Yeah. What what is DNC's um, sort of objectives, goals, priorities when they delineate harvest volumes on legacy project lands to build a fiber supply agreement? What's our, well, our goal is to do it as well as we can. It's a contractual obligation. I mean, when when we were negotiating with Plum Creek Timber, um, they you know, we bought a quarter of their land holdings in the state. And they owned 100, um, 1.2 million, and we bought 400,000 of it. <laughs> so they were saying, you know, we, you, we still need timber off this land, and you, the Nature Conservancy, will provide it for us. And we're like, whoa, and we, we hang on a sec. And it, but we, in fact, we've done similar things in Maine and in other parts of the country. So we did a, a pretty thorough analysis of the volume that was out there. We didn't just take them at their word for how much volume was out there and how much they wanted us to deliver. We went out and got a second analysis of, and then we negotiated back and forth. It was a very um, interesting negotiation and came up with a number. And now we're, we're contractually obligated to provide that much timber for the next, well, we're five years into it. We're almost done. Yeah. Is there an easement equivalent or an agreement that you enter into when you sell to the government? No. Um, well, although I take that back, when we a lot of the land we sold to the state to DNRC, that state trust lands, that blue land, a lot of that we have put easements with fish, wildlife, and parks on those lands. Um, and it's been an interesting kind of marriage of those two agencies in that land ownership and land management. But when we saw that the Forest Service or the DLM and the Forest Service, we do not. Um, and we don't feel the need to. There isn't, a, there isn't a, a mechanism that provides the same sort of protection on federal land. Um, these are sort of things aren't kind of become a tool. And plus, you know, go back to that map. I mean, the reason why we have what we have in the current economy is the public land and the protected private. So we, do, we don't have any, um, we're not worried about land being an individual land of course it's going to be working on it. But that's not, that's, that's not where the threats are in our, in our, all of our analysis. The threats to the biodiversity and the crown and all the other places we work is not um, public land. Yeah. Is, is DNC going to continue to try to consolidate the checkerboard pattern in Montana after these legacy project plans are built? You know, I would, I'd love to. I'd love to say we were going to. Um, but right now, we still have 96, 97,000 acres of land. Um, we're kind of up to our eyeballs and beyond with what we've done. So um, I don't see anything happening in the near future. But I think, I mean, that's, I, I, one of the things I really wanted, the points I wanted to make, um, that I don't think I did very well, is that that Plum Creek land, that pink land, is an opportunity. How many other states have that that vast amount of private land in one ownership? I mean, you can't buy 410,000 acres from 410,000 buyers, owners. You can do it when there's one owner. So Plum Creek has been a tremendous partner and opportunity in that way. They're incredibly important land and you're dealing with one entity that owns it all. Yeah. You touched on uh, doing these restoration projects in Fish Creek and them being like Neva and Neva free. Did, did you finish these projects or did you turn them over to the state without environmental analysis? No. That, <laughs> no, it's a very good point. You know, we turned them over and yes, the state has done a lot of NEPA on both their projects in Fish Creek and the Marshall Walk. Because they, could, they kind of took ours on. I mean, it, what we started, what, what, what our goal there was to start the trajectory and to get things moving so that it didn't have that inertia that a lot of climate sustained agencies do. We did, done, did a great project up in Chamberlain Creek, 
color and black, but that uh, it was an arm ownership. We can move the road, you know, we can we can do a lot of stuff for because it's ours right. and send it up. But in partnership with them, we didn't do anything. Say, hey, you know, we started this project. You want to take it? It was, you know, it was always very closely coordinated with everyone and working with town limited and town limited to get it started. But it was just easier to jumpstart it all. But no, I, I was, uh, I'm sorry if I, I was probably being too long. Um, I can't be joking. <laughs> Yeah. I wanted to ask a little bit about your involvement with the local community and then over the, the time that you always going to get all these different stakeholders to come to work together or if it's kind of one dominant group, kind of what, what has your been in your approach? That is a great question. Thank you for asking that. And you know, it's easy to talk about the Black Bear Town, which is small and Black Bear because we've been there for a long time. We have this great experience in Mineral County. Fish Creek is in Mineral County. And we've never been in Mineral County before. And Mineral County has a huge majority of forest service men help. And they wanted more forest service men. And they were very skeptical of what we were offering. And so what we did right away is we started having meetings and we met with county commissioners. And we had public meetings and we started a work, the working group, the Fish Creek working group. And we, you know, we were careful about selecting local leaders, people with influence, people who wanted to engage, um, and people who, you know, people who were interested. And what we started to do is mostly listen and to say, what is it that, what are your concerns? What do you want to see happen here? And how can we help? And in Mineral County, they were very clear, no more forest service now. They, they don't get enough um, money to pay for their, their county services. They don't get enough money off the, off the federal grants. Um, they, were, they didn't really want it to be concrete grants because they get property taxes off of that. Um, so we said, okay, we won't sell it to the Forest Service, but how about DNRC? And they're like, well, DNRC is good because you know, that's actively managed forest land, but DNRC doesn't pay property taxes either. Fish, Wildlife, and Parks pays property taxes on their wildlife management plans. Perfect. And at the same, so we spent a lot of time out there. We got to know people, we got them out on the ground, we walked around, and we listened. And then we followed up on what we heard. Um, the one thing that was really unfortunate, but very, uh, was really moved people while we were in the negotiations with Plum Creek, they also had a lot of their ground on the open market. You know, if you could have gone in and bought this really beautiful half section on the West Brook Fish Creek. And what our deal was, was if, if that land doesn't sell by November, we're gonna buy it in December, but if it doesn't sell by the end of November, then we get it. But if it sells by the end of November, Okay, it's sold, and we're not going to get it. Well, there was a piece, a half a section, 360 acres in the West Fork of Fish Creek, that we just missed. And it went to a private buyer, and, um, and you know, it's just the way it worked out timing wise. And as soon as that person bought it, they painted all, they fenced it, and they painted their fences orange, and they put up no trespassing signs, and then they got this big V6 or something down in the stream, and we're moving gravel, and so they were just like, you can't do that. That's not, you can't do that. It's like, perfect. And so it was a, it, because the people had been like, no, you know, private land is fine. Private land is, I'm not saying it's not. But it was a real eye opener. Like, oh, that's right. We lose our access if it goes into private hands. So while it was unfortunate that that important piece of screening wasn't protected on the legacy project, and I'm not saying it's not protected, but that it's in desperate shape now at all. Um, but it was a good eye opener for folks who tried out Fish Creek to say, no, 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 we would much rather have this <coughs> public hands so that we still have access to it and it can be managed for natural resources and uh, But that's a great question. Yes, Joe. Could, could you talk a little bit to the students about the properties that were called going to community owned mm -hmm. or community forests? Because I, I think. That goes over pretty fast. And, and, and they, they took out the slide about the Black and Community Conservation Area because I didn't want to spend a lot of it, but I'd love to talk just about that. Just for a minute, just so they understand that's another kind of property which yeah. get very innovative and in One of the outcomes of the Black and Community Project was um, when, when we first started talking about the project, 
one of the concepts was, well, maybe we can have a community for us. Maybe the community can own some of this land. Um, we, you know, especially that land around Orlando, around Orlando Mountain. So we said, okay, well, let's let's see what that looks like. And what we ended up doing is working with the Blackfoot Challenge um, and raising the money for so that a 5,600-acre chunk right north of Orlando, Orlando Mountain, is now owned by the Blackfoot Challenge. But it's, for that 5,600 acres, there's a line around 41,000 acres around that core piece that's managed together as the Blackfoot Community Conservation Area. And how they manage it is there's a committee of 15 people. And so it's a mix. It's a mix of Forest Service, Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, DNRC, Blackfoot Challenge owned land, and private land. And that creates 41,000 acres. So there's people from DNRC, Forest Service, Fish and Wildlife Service, um, I'm missing, on that committee as well, as well as local landowners <coughs> and people who are just interested um, stakeholders. So we have a teacher, we have a businessman, we have a trapper, we have a logger, um, and are all on that committee. And they make the decisions for that 41,000 acres. So it's cross-boundary. Um, management. And they've done these great, um, some great restoration projects. It's gone through the Forest Service, through the NRC, down into the Blackfoot Challenge, and then out on the private land. And the, the weed management, the grazing management, is done as a whole. So it is a really innovative um, way of looking at managing the Blackfoot community conservation area. And they're hoping to do something in the swan, well, with a smaller, you know, you don't need to live in the swan, it's so lush. Um, the Swan Ecosystem Center um, is looking to also have a community own chunk of land up there as well. And we're working with them. It's just a matter of coming up with the money to pay for it. Any more questions? Thanks so much. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to ask how is the name of the service funded? We're anywhere we can. <laughs> <laughs> Membership, uh, donations, um, private donors, foundations, <coughs> government funding. Um, you know, we're what we do because we're trying to do it on a large scale. We, we, we look everywhere. Great. Thanks so much.